So, um, yeah, yeah I mean, my pleasure to be sharing this link data session. I, I, apparently, it's the second link data session during the conference, but I couldn't find the first one. Um, so maybe there is just a typo. Um, but we have a quite uh, nice session with uh, three papers, actually, from di the different tracks. So we have this one that is in use track, and they have resources, and then we have a, a, a journal um, track paper. Um, but yeah, I don't want to steal more time from, from the Vincenzo, who is presenting a semantic enable optimization for the digi digital marketing campaigns, which is a um, very nice in use contribution to the semantic web. Okay. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me, or I have to use the mic? It's fine? Oh, which microphone? This one? Fine. So good morning, everybody. Uh, let me present you this, uh, this newspaper about a semantically enabled optimization of digital marketing campaigns. I will show you some results coming from the EW Shop project, which is uh, an European funded project. And uh, as the title said, uh, we are talking about digital marketing. Uh, digital marketing uh, companies uh, need to optimize marketing uh, uh, campaigns for their clients. Uh, whenever you start searching the, uh, a search engine like uh, Google, uh, many digital, uh, digital marketing companies start to place that bid in order to uh, advise you with some uh, uh, advertisements. Uh, <clears throat> Yacht is a Spanish company that runs campaigns uh, on search engines. And they generate traffic uh, by advertising uh, web pages uh, on uh, real-time bidding uh, platforms such as uh, Google AdWords. And uh, whenever they place a bid, uh, only when the bid uh, is won, the, the, the advertisement is shown in your uh, web client. So uh, the, the main goal of uh, companies such as uh, Jot is to <coughs> uh, generate traffic in an efficient way, so uh, to, to reach a large number of impressions uh, by, with a limited uh, amount of budget. And, sorry, and uh, when um, an advertisement is shown in your browser, they can collect some performance indicators, so how many uh, people uh, looked at uh, the, um, the advertisement, how many click on the link, how many buy the item advised. Uh, uh, we have also information about the location, the dates, and some other additional variables. And in marketing numbers, uh, Jot uh, managed several uh, campaigns. We are talking about uh, managing uh, 3,200 uh, accounts daily and uh, uh, about uh, 250 million impressions and up to uh, 9 million clicks per day. And uh, the, the, the marketing campaigns are run in uh, several countries, up to 74, and they cover uh, 17 languages. So we are uh, we're talking about a very uh, large asset, and in such a uh, in such dimension, uh, the, the objective is how to optimize uh, the, the campaign. So uh, I have to place my bids on which keyword I should play a bit. And uh, since we are talking about a large asset, the micro optimization is very useful. So if we were able to optimize uh, a small amount of keywords. Uh, maybe we will end up with uh, an excellent uh, monetization of our uh, campaign. Uh, we found out that uh, the keywords are affected by external factors which are not present in the original uh, job data set. For example, on the left, you can see that uh, uh, the keyword booger at home has a correlation with the rainy forecast in, uh, in Madrid. On the right hand, you can see how events can impact uh, on the um, user behavior in search engine platform. For example, you can see that the keyword shaving machines drop uh, after the uh, San Valentine day. So uh, this is an, an effect. 
uh, yacht uh, want to uh, extend uh, their optimization strategies by extracting the valuable insights, such as find correlation between performance indicators and external variables, such as the weather uh, as shown in this slide, uh, how to find new trends and patterns, and so basically how to have enough information for adjusting uh, their bids for the marketing campaigns. Uh, so uh, together we developed a pilot service, which is the, the main result uh, for Jot uh, from the EW Shop project. Uh, the pilot is a service, a weather-based campaign scheduler. The interface is quite simple. Uh, people at Jot can, uh, okay, doesn't work. Uh, can uh, upload a file which contains the keywords on which they want to run a new campaign. And uh, there is a predictor that is able to uh, give the user an insight about which, uh, which are the best dates uh, on which uh, uh, run the, the new campaign. So in this case, uh, the sixth day is the best one for running the campaign for the keyword in the upper uh, right left corner. And uh, also we can provide uh, additional uh, services, such as uh, if you have this information, we can advise client about the best keywords uh, 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 that have an higher impact depending on the standard factor, and also the opposite, which is the impact depending on the campaign property. So uh, we, we found out that uh, um, the same feature has a different impact on, in, several, in, in different countries, for example. Uh, how to support the weather-based campaign scheduler? Uh, we don't have the weather data already available in the JOT dataset. So uh, we need to extend this data set with the feature and then to train uh, machine learning models. Uh, semantics uh, together with machine learning uh, are the two technologies that Yacht uh, think that are useful to solve this problem. And uh, specifically when we are talking about semantics, we intend an enrichment based on semantic table annotation. So we want to uh, extend the values available in, uh, in the table with entities coming from uh, knowledge bases. And uh, also we want to uh, extend uh, the data set by using a graph-based modeling of the weather data that we don't, don't have here. And, and then uh, predictive model to find out which are the best dates to run a new campaign. So uh, what does it mean extension? So starting from the job data set on the left, we have uh, uh, the, the information about the region location. But uh, for querying the, the, the weather service, we need the coordinates. So uh, by the reconciliation step, we are able to link uh, the, the location strings uh, to the GeoNames knowledge base, which provide us uh, uh, the URI of each location and also the coordinate for each location. So we can uh, add new columns to the data set, which is the coordinates column. And then starting from this column, we can uh, query via API the, the weather data service. But we found out that uh, uh, this pipeline is not so uh, effective. So we try to optimize the flow by using a graph-based weather data modeling. So we just uh, uh, prefetch the data from the weather service put them in a document uh, database uh, that is Arango DB, and then we attach the Google, uh, the, sorry, the GeoNames ID directly to the weather observation. So the enrichment phase is uh, faster than, uh, than before. Uh, but we were talking about a large asset. We have a lot of historical data, and we have to reach all the historical data. Uh, we provide a tool that is able to, uh, that allows the user to uh, define its own uh, transformation pipeline by using a, uh, a UI in a web application. And uh, the user usually uh, works on a sample of, of uh, her data set. But uh, as we need to uh, enrich the world data set, uh, we need to provide Jot with uh, a large scale data environment that is able to process uh, uh, the, the transformation pipeline at large scale. So we provide this environment that you can see on the right, which is a scalable platform that runs the transformation pipeline in uh, batch mode. And also our transformation are repeatable. That means that uh, you can scale easier. 
and also you can apply the same uh, transformation on new and seen data. For example, if you have the same uh, table structure, but uh, the performance indicator are related to a new campaign run in the same country, but for a different time period, you can extend automatically that, this data. So once we enrich the data set, we can run the analytics. People at JSI uh, start to address the regression problem, so how we can predict the number of impressions for a keyword on a target day uh, for a given region and from weather features. Uh, they found out that the random forest is the best predictive model uh, in that case. Uh, they ran several tests on uh, regions only in Germany uh, over three months of the 2017, and they achieved uh, an RMS of uh, 0.77. As we will see, the, the, the score is not so good, but uh, uh, since we need to um, find the, the, the peaks in the impression, you will see that uh, this is a good, uh, a good result. So, lesson learned. Uh, from the business perspective, the enrichment pipeline was run on uh, a data set which contains uh, about uh, 22 million keywords uh, for uh, 50,000 uh, 50, campaigns, and now we are trying to enrich the data for uh, the 2018 and 19. Uh, for, from the analytics point of view, uh, we, we use only a few, uh, a few keywords that were filtered by uh, an expert uh, data scientist, and on this set of, of keywords, we found that the, the result are available for usage in production. That means that uh, if you find a peak, you can uh, uh, improve your monetization. Also, if you do not uh, uh, predict the, the exact number of uh, uh, impression. But of course, we have some limitations because uh, uh, training a model for each keyword is not a scalable solution. And also, uh, keywords uh, uh, the, the signal that we can have from the, the, the keywords is uh, too noisy, so we have to find uh, other methods to obtain a better uh, uh, stable signal. From the semantic point of view, uh, there are some pros and cons. The first one uh, that we found out the uh, links between GeoTarget and GeoName are still missing in the load, uh, uh, in the load cloud but they are very useful in uh, many real-world scenarios, such as this one. And uh, we did the linkage for uh, uh, two countries, which are Spain and Germany, but we have to extend the coverage of these links to the, the, world, to the entire world. Uh, we, we, we can say that uh, the semantic enrichment is a valuable application for the table annotation, uh, but we need uh, a smarter table interpretation approach in our tools if we want to really reduce the user effort while enriching uh, her data sets. And also, we can say that the semantics and the graph-based modeling are useful uh, in our application, even if the uh, main goal of the application is not the linked data pub publication. Uh, but since we want a pure table an annotation uh, approach, we have to find out which is the right uh, uh, trade-off between uh, tabular and graph-based representation, because we have to use a mix of the both. Uh, so we have uh, a few uh, feature words. These are the feature words that we explained in our uh, submitted paper, uh, but some of them we already start working on. For example, currently we are deploying the full uh, data enrichment analytic frameworks on job premises, so they can start uh, working on their own on uh, uh, the future campaigns. And also, together with weather features, we want to enrich the data set with uh, uh, information coming from uh, uh, the event registry, which is a platform that publishes uh, uh, events coming from news media. And uh, what we have already done is uh, uh, to, to cluster the keywords uh, by their semantic meaning in order to uh, obtain a more stable signal so we can train uh, models 
at the, key, at, at, the, at the cluster level instead of training uh, models at the keyword level, which was not so uh, scalable. And uh, what's next? We have to extend the Google GeoTarget to GeoNames link uh, data set. So, thank you. So, any questions? Um, so, I, I have one actually, um, well, probably two. Well, one is quite silly. Um, the first one is about the user interaction. No? Um, how, how much manual effort was in, in, this, in this work? Uh, okay, so. Uh, go back, go back, go back. As I said, the. Uh, we don't know in advance which are the, the, the keywords that uh, are mostly affected by weather, uh, weather parameters. Uh, so people at JOT found that, uh, for example, shaving machines is affected by events, for example, and uh, Burger at home is affected by, uh, by the rain forecast. But uh, you have, right now, uh, so far you have to manually select the, the best promising uh, keywords. Uh, talking about the links, uh, we manually designed uh, a sync pipeline to find uh, which are the links between Google GeoTarget and uh, uh, GeoNames, and we manually uh, revised the, the link because there are no tools to, to make this, uh, this task uh, automatically. And uh, basically this is the manual work that we all right. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, my, I mean, fully automatic system. I think is some basically impossible. No? Like, you 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 require like high precision and recall. Yeah, at some point, you mm. have the human. Um, but then since you were, you you are putting into the wheel like machine learning techniques, are you exploiting the user input to? Well, are you uh, somehow exploiting? I mean, the, the user input is useful, but are, are you exploiting to help you in the, in the subsequent task, like trying to help you? Like if you have some input from the user, you can exploit this in your optimization function, for Talking example. Talking about the reconciliation, yes, you can. <laughs> for the predictive model, uh, maybe yes, too, because uh, if your model uh, is wrong in uh, uh, predicting a, a peak, the user can say to the model, uh, hey, that's not true, so you can uh, just adjust the, the upper parameter of your model yes. and uh, All right, that's, yeah. achieve better performance. Because it is quite interesting you know, how to make the most of the user no, instead of, I mean, you could ask everything, but you could kind of ask s s small questions, uh, very easy to answer questions, but then you can make the most of that. I think it's key in, in this type of uh, real world approaches. Um, any additional question? Other hand, other, otherwise I will go for the silly question. Um, because they, when you have the graphs about burgers and everything and, and, and the San Valentine's uh, shaving machines, who was buying shaving machines? Um, who, was this, who was buying the, 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 the shaving machines? Was the the male partner or the female partner? Maybe the female partner. I hope so, otherwise <laughs> it's very offensive. Um, <laughs> but in any case, I mean, it's a terrible person. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, there are no further questions. Like, yeah, let's thank the, the speaker again. Um, and then our second speaker uh, is Dennis Oliver Kubica, and he's presenting Seman, well, Seman Git, a link dataset from Git, which is actually, from the name, looks very interesting approach and uh, an effort. Um, actually, do you know how to do the full screen mode view? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, is this thing on? No. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dennis Kubitzer, and I'm going to present Semengit, 
a linked data set from Git. And we are going to talk about, well, different topics. First of all, I want to give a short motivation of our data set and afterwards explain what salmon git really is. Then we do a first analysis to showcase the potential of the data set. And afterwards, I will explain our sustainability plan and uh, our current challenges that we face and the future work. So let's start with the motivation. Um, I'm not sure if you already heard it, but Microsoft acquired GitHub for an amount of 7.5 billion US dollar. And the interesting thing about this acquisition is not the amount of money that was paid, but uh, that these 7.5 billion US dollars are 30 times the amount of GitHub's annual revenue. So the question is, um, why is Microsoft willing to pay so much for GitHub? And I found an interesting opinion about that. In other words, Microsoft is not paying 7.5 billion for GitHub for its ability to make money. It's paying for the access it gets to the legions of developers who use GitHub's code repository products on a daily basis. And alongside with these developers, coders, uh, there's also the data associated to it. And the data currently contained on GitHub is from the official sources of GitHub, 31 million developers who contribute on GitHub, who follow each other, um, work together on the same projects, and who reference their own private data, for example, the home pages, the social media pages, and even the employers. Despite that, we have over two million organizations on GitHub. Some of them are institutional, like universities. Some businesses have organizations formed on GitHub. And there are even nonprofit organizations like Apache. And these organizations have an evolving set of members. And thirdly, maybe the biggest number, there are almost 100 million repositories on GitHub. And, of course, these repositories contain the code about the different projects. But they also contain information about people watching these repositories, people who have started these repositories, the issues related to different projects. So the thing is, how can we access this data? Um, well, first of all, the easiest way is to be GitHub. GitHub, or if you are a GitHub employer, you can have access to this data. The second thing what Microsoft did is to acquire GitHub and gain access to the data. Or, in our case, as a researcher, we can use the GitHub API, which is currently limited to 5,000 query, queries per hour. And considering the amount of data, it is nearly impossible to grab everything especially if you are interested in an analysis of, for example, the behavior of all coders on GitHub. So this is no option at all, but thankfully there were some other researchers who already collect data sets um, mirroring Git. And these approaches use, for example, listening to event handlers or are directly scraping the GitHub API. And, well, for these data sets, we have, of course, different providers. Um, for example, GH Torrent, GH Archive, the public Git Archive. And the problem is each and every one of these data sets, our data mirrors, is following their own approach. They have their own data models. They are focusing on different subsets of the data, depending on the methodology they are mining GitHub. Um, for example, some are only um, representing events occurring, others are mining the user database. And so the question is, um, oh, actually, actually um, it's not only for GitHub, 
GitHub is just an example. We have also other Git providers, for example, GitLab, SourceForge, etc. So we have a horrendous amount of data which is available on the internet concerning programmers' behavior. So the problem is we have a multiple set of partially overlapping data sets following different design decisions and covering different subsets of the actual data that is present. So the solution we propose is to use semantic technologies to create a knowledge graph out of these different data sources. So SemenGit is an abbreviation for Git plus semantics. And with our data set or our technology, we want to benefit from uh, two strengths that we see. First of all, the semantic strengths. We can merge these data sets from multiple providers and APIs that are accessible and even enrich the data by, for example, linking it with LOD data sets. Um, a good example is DBpedia, storing even information about which cities are located next to each other. And we want to use the graph strengths to enable an easier graph traversal for evaluating local structures in the data set. For example, the specific actions a developer did in his, let's, uh, let's say, last two years. So our approach is uh, based in the first step on a SemenGit ontology. Um, you see this on the right. And we did the visualization with WebVol. Um, the ontology is available at www.semengit.de and at our GitHub repository. And um, also in a big version on a poster, still presented um, at the booth. And I want to talk shortly about the design of this um, ontology. So um, it is basically multi-layered. Uh, we started with a Git core ontology, modeling the key Git functionalities that are provided by Git itself. Um, for example, commits that can be contributed by an author, which is, according to the Git protocol, just an email address. Then we introduced an abstraction layer of social features. Um, the reason is that all Git providers, GitLab, GitHub, etc., have their own social mechanisms implemented, which are technically um, almost the same, but almost. So example, for each and every one of these um, hosters, it's possible to follow other users, where the actual implementation slightly um, differs. And as a third layer, we finally introduced the provider-specific classes um, which are annotated, for example, with GitHub issue for issues that are implemented by GitHub. And the solo ontology is structured by inheritance from these different classes. So a GitHub user is inheriting from a Git user his email property. Or a GitHub issue is um, inheriting from the middle layer its social features. And, well, from this ontology on, we started creating our data set. And for now, it contains over 22 billion triples with a high interlinkage between these classes. Oh, sorry. Um, we already enriched our data set by providing links from GitHub to DBpedia in terms of geolocations. So we can access cities that users provided are their nationalities, their states. And this data set contains information about the social interactions between users, reported code issues, organizations and projects, and the respective followers and starers, and even the commit structure within projects, including pull requests, used programming languages, etc., etc. So, to give you an impression what you can do with such a data set, we did several analysis on top of this knowledge graph, and I want to present them shortly, not in too much detail. Um, so the first one is 
that we did a comparison of programming languages based on the region. You have many um, indexes of the usage of programming languages provided online, but they are agglomerates, mostly over the total net. And here we asked our knowledge graph um, for all the users who are located in a certain country, all the projects that are related to these users are owned by this user, and then we did a language analysis of how many percent of these respective repositories are, well, belong to a certain programming language. And in this example for China and USA, you see, for example, a huge difference by the usage of Java, which is definitely more popular in China, uh, in comparison to Ruby, which is really one of the favorite uh, programming languages in the United States, but not in China. So despite the analysis of programming languages, we can also look at international cooperation. So we asked ourselves, how are countries collaborating online with each other? And we derived an index for that. I don't want to go too much into the details. Um, but on this world map, you see a coloring of countries collaborating good with Indonesia. And you see, for example, some things which are quite obvious. Okay, Indonesia is, has a good cooperation with other English-speaking countries, or English-speaking countries, as a well, language of the world. But an interesting thing is also the Netherlands here. And um, if you have a little bit of knowledge about the history of Indonesia, it's a former colony of the Netherlands. So still after about 50 years of independence of Indonesia, there's a still a strong link between these two countries in cooperation. The first, uh, third analysis that we did was that we asked ourselves if social behavior Sorry again. Social behavior uh, within organizations um, might lead to a better success of the projects. And for this, we queried um, all the organizations that are on GitHub, all the repositories they had, counted the number of stars, and also we counted within an organization how many people follow each other. And you can see, for example, that for the same size of organizations, for example, 36 and more members, the more successful um, organizations have more internal follow relations. So it's a better social structure incorporated within these organizations. So that was the short analysis example. Um, I want to give three bullet points about our sustainability plan. Um, we guarantee that this resource is available until 2020, um, 2022, sorry. And um, we will provide the new data sets and ontologies on our website. The thing is, as the data set is quite big, we cannot provide all the data sets uh, that historically evolve but we provide old dumps by um, a set of scripts which are published on GitHub with, uh, with which everyone can recreate these older data set, uh, old data sets. Um, everything we do is open source. So our current challenges are that we want to include new data sources um, to our data set for example, GitHub, which is uh, GitLab, which is currently not present at all, but um, after the acquisition of Microsoft gained a lot of popularity in the last years. We want to implement the ability to query APIs for missing data directly from our data set. For example, in the case that we obtain information which is uh, falsifying each other from different data sources. And we want to increase the interlinkage to other data sets, for example, for scientific publications, 
which is often linked to GitHub, especially in the field of computer science. And the last thing, which is a little bit of effort in terms of big data architecture, is to provide in the end, hopefully, a public Sparkle endpoint so everyone can directly access and analyze our data set. So these are the references um, for the official numbers I gave in the beginning. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention and interest. Um, any queries? Oh, yeah. well, give you the microphone, otherwise. And, and you're the second. Yeah. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I just wonder <clears throat> that Microsoft pay, paid 7.5 billion for this data, and now you got uh, almost the same data for free. And uh, aren't you afraid of Microsoft, which can sue you in the court? Um, actually, the thing is, micro, or for example, on GitHub, there are a lot of repositories who are private. We cannot have access to this information. And the information that is contained in our data set, our knowledge graph, is already publicly available. The only bottleneck of this public availability is the API limitation. So basically, we are not doing anything illegal. It's data that is already public available. We are just making an easier access to it. So um, the... Uh, the, 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 the community of developers change, changes very, very quickly, right? So how do you deal with uh, the dynamics of, of GitHub? How often, you know, things change very, very quickly, and there is this limitation on the, uh, on, on the API access? How, so how do you deal with that? Um, actually, we are cr currently working on modeling such things. Um, for now, our ontology just gives a state of now for the database, we can only have, for example, relations. Okay, a user is related to an organization, but we don't keep track of changes for now. And actually, we wanted to have this ontology ready by the ISWC. We didn't manage it, but um, soon we will transform our data set to also encapsulate such information. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Can you tell me um, how general this approach is? So I'll give you a concrete reason. We are moving to represent all of the tools and workflow uh, developments in European life sciences into being done in GitHub or, or a private Git. And, we would, and this is effectively going to be a registry of these things. So this would be very interesting to adopt your approach um, in that kind of framework, how how easy would it be for us to be able to do that? Um, could you repeat the question? Ah. <laughs> I want to use your software. How easy is that to use and adapt? Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, well, our co uh, technology stack is completely published online. Um, the bottleneck is really the size of the data. And even we don't have the experience yet to handle such amount of data. We are trying to figure this out and eventually publish the results of that. But the technology stack, as it is, can be used as you want. It's documented. It's publicly available. Uh, for your sustainability point, have you approached software heritage? Um, not yet. Software Heritage is the organization run out of France that scrapes all of GitHub and Git and GitLabs in order to be able to preserve for all time software. And they have a UNESCO um, focused sustainability plan. You might want to talk to them. Okay, thank you very much. This is really interesting. <laughs> I think we have yeah, time for another question. Have you thought of applying your approach to um, monitoring DevOps and 
and, and, and operational software development in large organizations or even ar across communities. Like, uh, effectively, your data, if, 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 you could, if you could have other data sources, would your tools equally generally apply? Um, could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in, a lot of the problem with DevOps is, is measurement, right? And you actually have a tool that seems quite useful in terms of measurement. Um, basically, your problem is data. There are screeds of data in corporate environments about the effectiveness of their agile teams or their operational teams. I'm, I'm wondering, had you thought about maybe taking general, you know, your ontology would be a useful basis, you could extend it, and you could create a, a really interesting measurement tool, I believe. Um, yeah, we thought as a use case for it. For example, um, I showed you the analysis how internal follow relationships provide better coding quality. This is just a first example. But actually, you can derive a lot of good benchmarks from this data set, um, especially, for example, if you are trying to hire someone. Um, actually, you can't know what good code quality means. But with such a data set, you can analyze a lot of users um, about their own code quality, what makes a good coder. Um, for example, is he replying fast to issues? And such measures can be derived to benchmarks with that. But for now, um, we had no feedback from companies, ETC, that want to apply this. Is this answering your question? Yes. yes. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, uh, th thanks a lot for your questions and feedback, and, and let's thank the, the speaker again. And then our, our next speaker will present uh, one of the papers for the journal track that is about representation of the Czech National Open Data Catalog and its impact, and it's given by Jakob uh, Klimek. Jakub Klimek, and I am going to talk about um, the Czech National Open Data yeah, Portal. It's not, oh, okay, thank you. So, good afternoon again, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the Czech National Open Data Portal, but since the title of the paper is a bit uh, long, uh, let me start with some uh, preliminaries uh, so that we are all on the same page. Uh, about what I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, Czechia, also known as the Czech Republic, a country in the middle of Europe, a EU member state. Uh, why am, uh, am I saying this? Is uh, because uh, when I meet people outside of Europe, they usually don't know where, where, where the Czech Republic is. So um, that's one reason. The other reason is um, that uh, all the European rules apply to us the same they apply to other EU states. Um, and also the solutions developed uh, in Czechia are then therefore apl applicable uh, in, in other EU member states. Um, now, a data catalog is uh, typically, uh, or when I say data catalog, people typically imagine a software like this, where uh, users come to search for data sets based on metadata. Um, and with some of those solutions, unfortunately, the metadata lives inside of that software and is only accessible through a proprietary JSON-based API, for instance. Um, and now DCAT. DCAT is a W3C recommendation um, for data catalog vocabulary. And what's uh, important here is that uh, it is RDF-based, so uh, very, very usable uh, for us. Um, here is an example of a metadata um, description of a data set in, uh, in DCAT. 
It is all the expected metadata items, such as uh, data set title, uh, keywords, the publisher, or the dates issued and modified, and so on. Uh, but let's focus on <clears throat> on uh, only a subset of uh, of these properties, um, like these. Um, if you take a closer look at them, the values of those properties are typically uh, values from some code list. So a code list of uh, languages, for instance, used uh, with uh, DC terms language here. Uh, and the problem here, the interoperability problem with uh, DCAT here is that DCAT intentionally does not specify which code lists you should use for which properties. And this means that uh, each data publisher can uh, can use a different code list for the same property, and if they are not interlinked, there you have your interoperability problem. And uh, I mentioned that DCAT does this intentionally, and uh, this is because they leave it to communities actually implementing DCAT to decide on their own um, what code lists they want to use. Uh, and here comes DCAT AP. AP um, as in application profile. Uh, this application profile is um, for the European community uh, working with um, uh, with DCAT. It is um, managed by the European Commission, and what it does is uh, two things. <clears throat> One thing is that it uh, prescribes the control uh, well controlled vocabularies or code lists to be used with uh, specific metadata properties uh, of DCAT, and uh, those code lists are all um, accessible. Uh, the EU vocabularies uh, portal. Um, and the second thing is that they split um, classes and properties into mandatory, recommended, and, uh, and optional, uh, so that, uh, for instance, uh, we can validate or suggest that some of the properties are really essential. Right, another term um, I'm going to be talking about open data. So open data, data published on the web uh, with a uh, free license. You may have seen this uh, diagram before. It's the five stars of open data with um, the lowest, uh, uh, the first star being awarded for uh, at least specifying the open license and the uh, top level uh, being uh, data published as linked open data. Um, in Czechia, this is a bit uh, a bit stricter because open data in Czechia is a term in legislation, uh, and uh, the legislation also states that the data needs to use uh, an open format, which uh, basically means level three and above. And uh, what is crucial is that there is uh, a requirement that uh, each data set, uh, if it is to be called open data, needs to be registered in a so-called national open data catalog, which makes it quite a crucial piece of, uh, piece of software in the open data world in the Czech Republic. And the Czech National Open Data Portal is actually um, part of a, uh, of a whole hierarchy of uh, data portals. On top, there is the European Data Portal, which harvests the Czech portal and other European portals. Uh, and the data set metadata from them. And uh, <clears throat> in turn, the Czech uh, open data portal harvests some uh, local uh, portals of um, organizations in the public administration, for instance. And also if uh, an organization um, doesn't run its own uh, open data catalog, then uh, they can register their data sets directly uh, in the national portal. Uh, via a set of uh, registration forms, um, and uh, the last term I want to uh, I want to introduce to you is a uh, Czech specialty. It's a um, system called data mailboxes, and it is a special like um, email for official communication with the public administration. Basically, what you get is uh, proof of delivery. That's the most important one. So you send uh, something like a tax report to the public administration, and you get uh, digital proof that uh, the public administration received your, uh, your um, message. Right. So um, <clears throat> now that um, we are on the same page with the basic terms, uh, let me show you the uh, National Open Data Portal as it was in uh, 2015. So um, the, the portal was implemented by the Ministry of the Interior, uh, and uh, it looked something like this. Uh, it used, at that time, already obsolete portal uh, of public administration. 
um, and it was implemented as a snippet there, and uh, it went something like this. <clears throat> you, as a, as a publisher of data, uh, basically registered uh, your data set or local catalog using uh, a little bit nasty HTML-based form. Uh, and uh, you downloaded its representation in an XML file. And then you were required to send this file using the uh, data mailboxes to the ministry. And in the ministry, the message was received and stored in uh, one of the databases. And uh, then a script came. And uh, if it was a dataset registration, the registration was copied right away into the database of datasets. And if it was a catalog registration, then a harvest or script came, harvested what was in the, uh, in the local catalog, and stored the result also in the uh, datasets uh, database. And on top of that, there was, again, uh, not so pretty and not so uh, user-friendly um, interface for showing uh, the data sets. And uh, there was, for instance, no good search functionality on top of that. Uh, so it was really, really hard to use, especially with the number of uh, data sets we had. We had uh, more than 100,000 data sets. So imagine going through that if you only can list uh, and page through it. It was uh, quite terrible. So uh, <clears throat> instead of waiting for the ministry to actually uh, fix this on their own, at the Charles University, we uh, exploited the uh, proprietary XML API of the catalog, um, and um, we created a transformation um, <clears throat> uh, into um, RDF representation, Nikit AP representation, and we published that as a Sparkle endpoint. We uh, did the IRID referencing, and we put together a simple um, front-end viewer uh, that users could use to actually view the DKIT AP um, records. And the, uh, the viewer looks like this. Um, it's in check, obviously, so you cannot uh, know what the data set is about. But what you can see uh, here in the middle, and there is classification of the data set, and it is, uh, the items are in English, actually. And this is one of the advantages of the EU vocabularies and the code lists there I mentioned, uh, because uh, they are already translated to all EU languages, which means that uh, even though the Czech public administration registered this data set with uh, Czech uh, labels of those items, um, you can see them also in English, and this makes uh, creation of multilingual interfaces much, much simpler. Also, all these actually lead to the URIs of the, uh, of the items, uh, so you can click through and dereference them. Uh, <clears throat> and then in 2018, something very bad happened uh, to the catalog. Uh, the ministry had to switch suppliers for the portal of public administration. So th they did that. And the new supplier, when they deployed the new solution, they somehow forgot that there was a national open data catalog in there. So they deployed the portal without one. So we were in the state where we were, uh, we, ha we had this legislation saying all open data needs to be uh, registered in the catalog. And there was no catalog. Well, that was... Uh, really bad situation for the ministry. Fortunately, uh, at the university, we at least had this second part, right, that was still there because that was not running at the ministry. So this um, <clears throat> temporary solution actually became for a whole year the only official uh, open data catalog in the Czech Republic, although read-only because all the registering backend was gone. Uh, and we were tasked with uh, re-implementing the backend and the registration forms. So we did that. Uh, the registration forms now um, became like a pretty nice uh, web form with uh, autocomplete validation, help, and all, all this. This is, by the way, a standalone application producing Nikit AP records. Um, and uh, this was um, the whole, or oh, this is actually still the current architecture of uh, the National Open Data Catalog. In the middle here, we have Virtuoso Open Source, a triple store with all the data. It is now separate from all the software. Um, here are the uh, local catalogs being harvested by our ETL pipeline. Uh, and the pipeline stores the DKTP representation in the triple store, which handles Sparkle endpoint and uh, dereference. And it also generates uh, dumps in TRIG, HDT, and uh, CSV for those who are still not willing to work with linked data. And it also populates the, uh, the front end for, for, for the users. Um, 
there was one line missing actually here because we still had to use the same mechanism for actually uh, receiving the registration message. Uh, so the, here you download an RDF representation of the record and you still need to send it as an attachment through the data mailbox system uh, to the catalog. But otherwise, uh, it is, the, the blue lines are all DCAT AP um, data. This is how the ETL pipeline looks like. It may seem a bit complex, but it does lots of things. Uh, one th thing worth mentioning is this part down here actually uh, is a large part and is solely responsible for uh, dealing with the legacy CKEN JSON-based APIs. Uh, if this part wasn't there, it would be much more simpler. Um, right. So what was the impact of uh, our efforts? Well, um, this catalog actually became the first uh, official catalog um, publishing its metadata uh, as a linked open data in a Sparkle endpoint, uh, which made the European Data Portal actually implement a Sparkle harvester of these data uh, records. Uh, we use this as a good example of usage of web standards and open source, open source software in uh, public administration because uh, this system was also the first system in the Czech public administration that was completely open source. And we use the data contained in the catalog to uh, promote uh, linked open data to data consumers and also to students. And... Uh, Currently, we are working on adding multilingual metadata support so that also the data set titles and descriptions can be in multiple languages. We are implementing DCAT2 and DCAT AP2 um, <clears throat> so that we can support uh, data services in addition to downloadable files. We are working in dockerization uh, for, yeah, we are working on dockerization of the whole solution so that it can be deployed anywhere for instance, as a local catalog, which is DCAT AP compliant. And uh, finally, we are working on adding um, quality indicators. Uh, <clears throat> so what you can see here is an external link from the interface, uh, and uh, the user can see before he clicks on the link uh, whether we saw the link as broken or uh, okay, and uh, when we checked it last. Okay, that's uh, all from me. Thanks for the attention. Um, yep. well, uh, thank you. I am from Latvia, actually. I know where Czech Republic is located. Uh, but mm. I, I wonder, uh, uh, for instance, I, w I wish to publish my open data. Uh, can I do it automatically? I mean, let... Uh, can I uh, register or unregister this data set fully automatically uh, with, without the need to be reviewed by some uh, government officer, for instance? C can it be done fully automatically? Okay, so this depends on the catalog uh, you want your data to be registered in. If it is uh, like an official catalog, uh, uh, for instance, in the Czech Republic, um, you need to be part of the public administration to be able to register. But then when you register, it's up to you. Uh, there is no review of, of that. Um, of course, you can have your own um, catalog of a company, let's say, and there is nothing stopping you from registering there. Mm, I had a look at your, the, the tools that you publish, so your forms and uh, viewer for DCAT. Uh, do you intend to upgrade them to the n newest version of uh, DCAT, so 1.2? Uh, yes, uh, we are working on it uh, right now. We actually are in the process of implementing DCAT 2 and DCAT AP 2. Uh, we also provide some feedback to uh, the guys uh, working on DCAT um, based on that. And uh, these two tools, the DKT AP Viewer and the forms, are now going to be already mentioned in the implementation report of DKT2. Hello, Jakub. Um, when I say my name, you'll probably guess my question. So, Nicholas Carr, I'm in the same working group as you. Um, uh, in addition to DCAT2, of course, part of the charter of 
um, the data exchange working group is about mechanisms for exchange. Now, you've indicated that you've used the Sparkle endpoints and so on, and that's, that's a standardisation we understand. But a more general one would be content negotiation by profile and these other kinds of non-Sparkle dependent systems. Is that on your horizon to deal with, or is this something you, you haven't thought about yet, the content negotiation by profile? It is something we haven't thought about yet. Um, but uh, I definitely see this as a crucial part of the standardization effort uh, because this actually was something that we ran into right away when we published uh, the metadata from the, uh, from, from the portal as linked data. So we, we did dumps, we did a Sparkle endpoint, uh, a graph store protocol, and IRID reference. And um, uh, we said to the European data portal, here it is, please harvest us. And uh, at that time, they only knew how to harvest the Seekin based, uh, the Seekin JSON based API extended with some fields. And uh, they actually struggled a bit with uh, harvesting using any of those four uh, linked data ways of doing that. So finally, uh, what they are now doing is that they ask for the list of data sets using a Sparkle endpoint. And then one by one, they uh, take it from the graph store protocol. Um, but uh, there was definitely a lack of standardization for this. So we had ECAT and ECAT AP saying how the data should look like, but we had no guidance uh, as to how they should be exchanged, basically. So just a small follow-up on that. So right now I'm doing bits and pieces of coding to extend the DCAT, sorry, the CCAN DCAT plugin to do standardized content negotiation by profile. So you'll be able to say to your catalog, please give me DCAT AP, please give me DCAT and it should be it should be standardised so that ultimately the C CCAN would look like any other implementation of content negotiation by profile. So that's the, that's one of our implementations. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. All right. Th thanks again for the nice discussion and, and questions. And since we are between yeah you and lunch, I think we should thanks the speaker again and then let's go and enjoy the lunch.